Let the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. Welcome to the second service. Now, this is the overtime service. So I have to be careful in the first service because we've got to follow some timelines there, but we could be here all day. Amen. Welcome to the overtime second service. We're glad you're here. I made a few people nervous with that. Amen. I'm thankful to be in the house of the Lord. You can be seated. Amen. We just are honored and thankful to be in the presence of the Lord today. And this is a special day, a special weekend. And we want certainly to give honor to all those who have served in any branch of military. And because of their service, uh, some of the unpaid, of course, the ultimate price and gave the ultimate gift. And those who gave their lives for our freedom to be able to be here. It is certainly more than just a day off. It is more than just a time for picnics and family time. But we certainly want to honor those who have given everything and those who continue to serve. I'm not only thankful for those who have served and those who are currently serving, but I'm also thankful for those young men and young women who right now at this very moment feel in their heart that is the direction for their life. And uh, because of that and generation after generation, we're still free to serve the Lord and to worship Him and many other things, of course, that come with our freedoms. I want to uh, announce to you today after some prayer and consideration, uh, beginning this Wednesday night on the 27th, we are going to go back to a live midweek service. We have had a couple of weeks now and several services for us to sort of get a pulse of, um, of what we're doing and, and perhaps who may uh, be comfortable attending at this time. And uh, for those who still are not comfortable coming or for those who are not able to come, we're still going to be videoing the services and they will be uploaded uh, and available the following day. And uh, so we just ask you to um, prayerfully consider what you'd like to do about that. But we're going to be here at 730 as always, and we're just going to have church as unto the Lord. Amen. I'm excited about what God is doing, and I want to say again, if this is your first time being here, I want to publicly thank all of those who have, <coughs> who have just so aptly stepped up to the plate and helped us uh, figure out what we didn't know how to do just a few weeks ago. And uh, we're still continuing to learn, but I'm thankful for those who have given themselves and made themselves available for such. I'm thankful to be in the house of God, and I'm thankful to be here with you in the house of the Lord. It's a privilege to be able to come to church and how well we know that now. I uh, trust we never had taken that for granted, but it's there's a chance. There is a real chance that... Uh, we just thought, well, if we don't go today, if we don't go tonight, there's always another time. And how quickly, quickly, how quickly we learned the complexion of those things can just change. And uh, but I believe that we're on the right path. I'm thankful for the uh, the health and the healing that we're experiencing in our nation and around the world. And believe in God. Uh, who who would have ever dreamed that we would just long for normal? Amen. Just normal. And I know that normal is a relative word, but nevertheless, we're thankful for normal. And uh, I appreciate that and trust that the Spirit of the Lord will help us today. It is indeed an honor to be in the house of God. And it is always an honor to be able to preach the word of the Lord. And with that, I'm going to ask you to join me in the book of 1 Kings chapter 17. I'm going to read the first five verses of this passage and I will tell you that it is a familiar story to many of you who are sitting here, but uh, at four o'clock yesterday morning, a little bit, just a few minutes before four, the Lord just woke me up. I went to the back room in our home, and I sat down and opened my Bible and began to read, and I believe that God just directed me to this passage of Scripture and specifically to this thought, and I believe that it is relevant to our day, and I think it is pertinent to where we are as a church and uh, perhaps not just this local assembly, but others as well. But the book of 1 Kings 17 and 5, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. 
And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook. And I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is, before Jordan. It is from verse number 3 that I would like to draw my subject today. He said, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is, before Jordan. And from that, I want to preach to you from this subject today, hidden by the brook, hidden by the brook. Now, if you know anything about Elisha, the man of God, mightily used of the Lord, you would certainly know that, that Elisha was not a man that could ever be charged with being diplomatic. Elijah was a man that had a voice that thundered and spoke boldly against the spirit of idolatry that had so infiltrated the nation. He was a crusader of sorts. He would be perhaps what we would think of as an Old Testament John the Baptist. John the Baptist, a voice came out of 400 years of silence and darkness, preaching a message of repentance. Some supposed him to be a wild man. He wasn't altogether concerned about what people thought about him. He was more concerned about what they thought of his message because he was preaching a message of repentance. And this is sort of what we have in the life of Elijah. He was a courageous man, courageous enough to confront and to face sin, courageous enough to confront Ahab the king and rebuke his sin of idolatry. One of the many things that we recognize Elijah for was the prophecy that he gave of an impending drought. He said, it's not going to rain, and it won't rain again until I say that it's going to rain. And as the drought continued, of course, always what follows drought is going to be famine. Ahab began to look for Elijah because he said, i got to find the man, and I've got to settle the score with the man that I deem to be the one responsible for this drought that has stricken our land. But in truth, it wasn't Elijah that was the man to be held accountable for the drought and the consequent famine, but it was really the sins of Ahab and his wife Jezebel. It was their sin that led a nation to disobey God and to break his holy covenant. When they did so, and when we do so, we invite the judgment of God upon our lives. Because as my aunt used to sing a little song most of the time just to uh, try to rib me, she would say, you can't do wrong and get by. And we can't break the covenant of God and think that somehow God is just going to turn his ear or his eye away from those things. Amen. They invited, when they brought idolatry into their lives and allowed idolatry to infiltrate their camp, they invited the judgment of God. However, in the midst of all of this judgment, God had a special place to hide his servant. That hiding place was by a brook east of Jordan. If you're familiar with the story, it wasn't that God just hid him by the brook, but we also know that God used a very unorthodox method to feed the man of God during this season. There is a central truth, I think, that we can find here, and I believe that we can find it not only in this story, but I believe we can find it from Genesis to Revelation. That central truth is how God leads his people. God always leads us one step at a time. It's an age old promise that God made to Moses back in Deuteronomy 33 and 25 when he boldly said, as thy days, so shall thy strength be. Amen. As we give ourselves daily to his word and avail ourselves daily to his promises, he committed to us, I will lead you and I will guide you. Isaiah 49 and 10 says of the Lord, he that hath mercy on them shall lead them. I believe today that I am speaking to men and women that know what it's like in your lifetime to be led by God. Amen. I'm not just talking about days gone by or decades past but to be led by the hand of God where God would strategically place you here for a season and perhaps there for a season leading us 
day by day. I'm thankful that we're serving a leading God, aren't you? A God who understands where we are and a God who clearly understands where we're going. I think it's important to note that that God did not unfold a three-year plan for Elijah. God didn't lay out a master plan. They never sat down at a drawing table to decide this is what we're going to do this month. This is where we'll be 12 months or this is where we'll be 14 or 18 months in. Instead, God did what God always does and God directs us and God leads us at critical junctures of the journey. Amen. We may go many, many miles without ever hearing the voice of God. God may give us a directive. God may give us some snippet of instruction. And we may walk many days, perhaps months or even years, without God ever bringing it up again. But you see, he's not being quiet just to be quiet. He's just being quiet because it's not time to speak yet. But when you get to the next critical juncture, when you get to the next critical change place, there is one thing we can rest assured of God will speak again. Amen. I believe that one of the most important things to understand in addition to the fact that God was going to speak again to Elijah is the fact that Elijah was going to hear his voice and he was going to obey his voice. In our text in 1 Kings 17 and 3, the Bible says, The Lord said to him, Go hide thyself. Now, we know that this was God's command for the moment. This is where God was going to put Elijah for a season of his life. But I want you to know that we understand because we know the rest of the story. But I believe that that Elijah understood because he knew his God. He knew that God told him to go hide yourself by the brook. But this is not your permanent station in life. This is not where I'm going to hide you and leave you. This is not where you will serve out the remainder of your days. Or this is not where your life and ministry will end. Three years later, God was going to do the complete opposite of this. Amen. He says, go hide yourself. But God knew that one day the river would dry up. And so then God tells Elijah, now I want you to go to Zarephath and go to the widow woman. And she is going to sustain thee. And so if I could say it this way, in one season of his life, the Lord said, Elijah, go hide yourself. And then another season of his life, the Lord is saying, Elijah, go introduce yourself. Go reveal yourself. Amen. Because you, uh, we have to understand that when Elijah went and hid himself by the river for all intent and purposes, his earthly ministry came to an end. He was no longer traveling. He was no longer here or there declaring the word of God. And I will tell you that when Elijah hid himself by the brook, he spoke one drought. He spoke one literal, natural drought into existence. But when Elijah hid himself by the brook, it by volition, it brought about another drought. And that drought was the absence of the word of God. And I will tell you, it would be a bad thing to go through a drought. And I know we go through some dry times and dry seasons in our natural life. But oh, what a critical thing to go through a dry season of the word of God. Amen. How many times have we walked into the church? church house or into our private prayer closet and said oh Lord speak I just got to hear your voice amen there were, I was I was talking to a, a friend yesterday called hadn't ha- heard from him in quite some time and and uh, we, we we chatted for quite some time on the phone we got ready to end our call and he said well I just want you to know I didn't call for any particular reason I just wanted to hear your voice I just wanted to hear your voice what a compliment amen I thought oh Lord there are times that I just go to my prayer closet there are times I kneel in a personal altar I'm not there because my world is falling apart I'm not there because chaos has been set loose <laughs> hallelujah we come to church today we didn't come to church just so that we could get our name on the roll. We didn't come to church just because we were singing. We didn't just come to church because we were the ones preaching. We didn't come to church because somebody we like was going to be highlighted. No. We, Lord, I just want you to know I didn't want anything in particular. I just wanted to hear your voice again. I just wanted to hear you speak into my life one more time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. The Jewish people 
to the Jewish people God's word. And it ought to be to us the same way. It was like rain from heaven. It was essential to their spiritual lives. It was necessary for the furtherment. Never doubt, never doubt for one moment that the, that the silence of Elijah, the silence of God's servant was direct a direct judgment of God against those people. Because to not hear, to not hear God's living word is to forfeit a measure of life itself. It was David, the psalmist David, who penned these words in Psalms 28 and 1. He said, Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock, be not silent to me, lest if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down into the pit. I would say that upon our heart and upon our lips when we walk into the house of God, we ought to cry out to the Lord, our rock, and say, O God, be not silent to me today, but oh, speak to me, whether it's in the words of the song, whether it's in the ministry of our praise and worship, or the ministry of the word of God but oh God lest I go down into the pit say something say something there is no greater insult in all of the world than to be ignored you ever been around somebody that wouldn't talk to you if you've got half of a conscience that ought to drive you insane amen because silence I feel the need to move on. At the brook Cherith, Elijah had safety and he had sustenance. He had everything he needed because God said, I'm going to hide you here for a season. In addition to that, every morning and every evening, the ravens brought him what he needed to eat for the day. Now, under the Mosaic law, the raven was considered unclean. As a matter of fact, it was included in Leviticus on a list of things that were forbidden foods. Yet God said, I'm going to use these fowl and they are going to sustain the man of God. They're going to sustain my man and I am going to change their very nature. The very nature of a raven is to get and not give. <laughs> the very nature of a raven is to take and not supply. Amen. But God said, I'm going to change the very nature of this bird for a season of time. And they are going to obey my voice. And they are going to be at my directive. And I want you to also understand that I never have believed for one moment that those ravens were sharing their menu with Elijah. I don't believe they were bringing him a piece of a rotten carcass. I don't believe they were bringing him a piece of something that they had left over. Amen. I believe that God was supplying him exactly what he needed. Amen. The only thing they were was transportation. They were just to get it from A to B. They were to get it from the source. Amen. They were to get it to the, from the source to the mouth of the man who needed it. Amen. I believe that just like God dropped manna into the camp for Israel during their wilderness journey, that same God also brought the necessary food to Elijah while he waited for God to signal the next move. However, as time marched on, <clears throat> and as the drought grew worse, the brook dried up because ultimately that is the nature of a brook. And as the as as the brook dried up, this left the prophet of God, the man of God, without water. Now, to be without water is a serious thing. But I think it's important to note that he never made a move until the word of God spoke and told him what to do. And I'm just going to pass on some old advice that I received many years ago. And I've said it many, many times to people through the years. When you don't know what to do, don't do anything until you get some direction from God. Amen. When you don't know where to turn, don't turn. When you don't know where to go, don't go. Amen. Just put yourself in a holding pattern and say, Lord, until you speak, I'm going to make myself available right here. Amen. It has been well said time and time again that the will of God will never take us where the grace of God cannot keep us. Amen. That is not just a slogan for a bumper sticker. That is not just something cute to put on our wall. I'm going 
want to tell you that the will of God has taken us to some bizarre places at times, but it was not so strange that his grace could not keep us. God's will has taken us where we were woefully uncomfortable, but his grace was always there to sustain us. His will will never lead us where his grace cannot keep us. Paul, he sought for God multiple times. I need deliverance. I need help. I need you to help me in my supplication. And the Lord just had one answer for his prayer. Paul, my grace is sufficient. I will never lead you where my grace cannot keep you. He then Paul realized in a moment of time I would be much better with the revelation and the power and the anointing of God that is moving in my life than to be delivered from what I deem as a thorn in my flesh. I'm grateful for the grace of God. Amen. God's grace, it always can and it always will care for us. Isaiah 33 and 15 and 16, if we were to boil these, these two scriptures down to one concise statement, amen, this is what it would say. He that walketh righteously, bread shall be given to him and his waters shall be sure. Amen, if you want the supply of God to be never ending in your life then the key is to walk righteously before God I can't see how close to the edge I can get I can't see how far I can push the envelope but I say oh God order my steps today in your word and let not iniquity have any dominion over me Lord but let me walk in the power of your righteousness let me walk in the purity of the sunlight of your spirit and I know I know the end result result of that was that bread and water will always be supplied. It will always be in my life. The Jewish, the peop, the Jewish the pe people much like you and I <laughs> depended on the seasonal rains for the success of their crops. Of course, of course it goes without saying perhaps they did not have modern technologies to bring them irrigation like we have today and so they were dependent upon God for the very water that fell from the sky. Now, if the Lord did not send the early rain in October and November, and if God himself did not send the latter rain in March and April, then there was sure to be a famine in the land because famine always follows drought. However, the blessings of these biannual rains, amen, they, they, these people depended upon these biannual rains, they depended upon heaven to open up. And it was God's way of saying, I am blessing you. Amen. It depended, but that blessing depended upon them obeying the covenant of the Lord. In Deuteronomy 33, or in 28, 33, God warned the people that their disobedience, he said, your disobedience is going to turn the heavens to brass and the earth to iron. Amen. He said, when you stop obeying me, I want you to understand the end result of that is that heaven is going to be brass and the earth will be like iron. Or in other words, there's nothing that's going to penetrate that because you can't do what you want and God continue to bless you. You can't do wrong and get by. You can't just go your own way and God is just going to nod his head in agreement. The land belonged to the Lord and, the, and if the people defiled it, then God said, I'm not going to bless it. I'm not going to bless what you're going to defile. And I believe the principle of that stands true today. It's likely, it is likely that Elijah appeared before King Ahab somewhere around this October time period, about the time of the early rain, that the early rain should have started. And so if this be correct, I want you to think about something with me. That means that there had been no rain since the spring in March or in April. Amen. So if, if that is the case, then it was here, it was at that critical place that Elijah said there will be no more rain for the space of three years. I believe that's why James, in the book of James, speaks about this drought being three years and six months without rain. It was that previous six months and then the next three years of that prophecy. Amen. The people were following Baal. 
And so God said, because you're following Baal, I can't send rain. And I can't honor my covenant with you. You see, God always keeps his word. (laughs) Yes, he does. Whether God says, I'm going to bless you, amen, for your obedience, or whether God says, I'm going to discipline you for your sin, God keeps his word. I've mentioned this before, but I was raised not alone. Some of you were raised by parents like this, that if we were ever away from the house and we started acting human, and our parents said, when we get home, Amen. Were you raised by parents that kept their word? (laughs) It didn't matter how many stops you made along the way. You can stop getting milk. You can stop getting bread and see the neighbors and they can stand at the fence and talk for a while and you think for sure. (laughs) I'm glad to be raised by parents that kept their word. God never held back the rain. God... Rather, God held back the rain because of the fervent prayer of Elijah. Of Elijah, he would, he was going to send the rain again for the same reason to the same man. I will go to that scripture in James. The Bible says in James five seventeen, Elias, which means Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth. By the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again. And and the heaven gave rain. And the earth brought forth her fruit. The fruit was there all along. What it needed was God's people to be obedient. When God's people were obedient. God would let the heavens open. And the rains come. And when the rains came. The fruit of the land was in the soil. And God said I'll let it all come again. But it all is dependent. On this pivotal point called obedience. Can I tell you today. That it is no different. In 2020, amen, it is no different in the hour in which we live today. Amen, it is dependent upon our obedience as to what God will release in our lives. And so I say, Lord, help me to live a life you can bless. And then bless me as much as you feel that I can or that you can. Amen, for the next three years, it would be the word of Elijah that would control the weather in Israel. Think about that. For the next three years, it's all going to depend on this man, this one singular voice. Amen. Three and a half years of drought. I believe it was going to prepare the people for the dramatic thing that unfolded on top of Mount Carmel, a contest that would be between the priest of Baal and the prophet of the Lord. And like a faithful servant attentive to his master's command, Elijah stood faithfully before the Lord that he served with all of his heart. An extended drought, an extended drought, announced and controlled by the prophet of God, was going to send a very strong and a very clear message to those priests of Baal. Because Baal was supposed to be the storm god or the rain god. And so God says, we're going to show you who's God. We're going to show you who's God. Amen. Some suppose that Elijah lived at Cherith for about a year. And then it was there that God told him to leave. Now, again, there's no doubt in my mind that Elijah understood his place by the brook was just a temporary dwelling place. This this is not the end all, cure all. However, when God told Elijah to move, I fully believe that he couldn't have nowhere anticipated where God was going to send him. The Lord hid him by the brook of Cherith, and then he sends him to a city called Zarephath. Now, Zarephath is not too far from Ahab and Jezebel's home. Remember Ahab and Jezebel? This means God was sending him into enemy territory. Even more, God had instructed him to live with a widow whom he had instructed to care for him. Now, I say again this with great deference to all widows and especially what the Bible refers to as widows indeed. Widows, especially scripturally, were among the most needy people in the land. Therefore, it would make no sense for God to send a needy person to a needy person 
to get your needs fulfilled. You're not going to have much luck borrowing money from somebody that's broke. Amen. So don't ask me. But when God, when God sends us, we must obey him and then just leave the rest in his hands. Because we don't live on the explanations of man. We live on the promises of God. One, one man so aptly said it this way. He said, because humanity is so prone to look at the bucket and forget the fountain, then God has to frequently change his means of supply to keep our eyes fixed on the source and not the result. After the nation of Israel entered the promised land, according to Joshua 5, manna ceased to fall into the camp. And it was at this juncture at Joshua 5, God said, I'm going to still feed you, but I'm going to change how I feed you. Yes. Now, I believe scripturally we can find in the Old Testament and the New Testament multiple occasions where God changed his method, but he never changed his promises. During the early days of the church of Jerusalem, for instance, in Acts chapter 4, when you get toward the end of that chapter, you're going to read that, that the believers of the New Testament church had everything they needed because the scripture said they had all things in common. And so God said, here's the system. I want you to pull everything that you have into one pot and everybody live out of the same pot. And so they had all things in common. But a few years later, we see in Acts chapter 11 that God told them that you're going to need to go to the Gentiles of, of Antioch and they will supply what you have need of. When God first sent the disciples, he told them, don't even worry about the shoes or the clothes that you wear. You just go and I will take care of all of that. But when God commissioned them the next time, he told them to take clothes with them and raiment. My point is, is that their message didn't change, but their methods did change. Amen. And so now God, it, by the same token, God had sent Elijah. He sent him, amen, to a full brook. And I want you to understand that the drought that was going on didn't affect that brook overnight. It wasn't like it was a full babbling brook one day and the next morning he got up and woke up to dry ground. But little by little, that brook began to shrink. The babbling brook was no longer babbling, but it hadn't been babbling for a long time by the time he reached this point. And so Elijah was sent to a full brook and he watched it all dry up. But now God, in his infinite wisdom, was going to send him to a widow woman that had nothing. He was about to learn what God could do with empty things. He had watched the fool go to empty. And now God is going to say, I want to show you. And I want you to watch the empty go to full. Amen. I'm going to tell you that I believe I'm preaching to people today. We've lived long enough in this life. We've watched the fool go to empty. Amen. Have we ever watched the full go to empty? But we've also watched the empty go to full. And we realize he's a God that can keep us. He's a God that can sustain us. Whether it is plenty. Amen. Whether it is full or whether it is empty. God is a God that can sustain us. The fact that the woman had been instructed by the Lord. I think it's, it's important to note. Just because she had been instructed by the Lord was not necessarily proof positive that she was a believer in the God of Israel. I say that because she spoke about Jehovah to Elijah as this. She said, it's the Lord your God, not the Lord our God. So she may not have even been a believer. <laughs> but God said, I'm going to use her. Amen. I'm going to use her. I need an empty vessel that I can fill up and take care of my, my child. Amen. Her assets were few. It was just a little bit of oil. It was just a little bit of barley. It was just a few sticks for a fire. She didn't have a whole lot in her resume. But I'm going to tell you, amen, she had everything she needed to take care of her and her son and the man of God. Amen. Why? Not because she had much, but because the man that came into her life was serving a God 
Oh, they had it all. Hallelujah. God had promised, I'm going to take care of you, Elijah. And I'm going to take care of those that take care of you. And I will bless them that bless thee. And I will curse them that curse thee. I'm talking about a God who knows where we are today. A God who knows where we are today. Elijah gave her God's promise that neither the the grain barrel or the cruise of oil would be used up before this drought ended. Amen. God would one day send a rain and the earth would one day bring forth again. But until that time, he said, I will supply everything you need. And can I tell you, he did. In our modern society, with our credit cards and bank accounts and home equity lines of credit, we need to be very, very careful. To remember that everything we have is a gift from God. It would be a very foolish thing for you to think what you have in the bank, what you have with a deed with your name on it, what you have as a title to you in a filing cabinet somewhere has come your way because you're just that good. It was because of your education. It's because of your ability to do this or your ability to do that. I'm going to tell you, we have what we have because the grace of God has brought it into our lives. And I just feel like telling you today and boldly declaring that what you have and what I have can all be taken away from us in a moment of time. I'm talking about before the setting of this day, son, it can all be gone. Amen. You may say, well, you know, I've got too much. I own too much. It couldn't go away by the time the sun sets today. Can I tell you, sir, that your life can so radically change by the setting of today's sun that whatever you own would mean nothing to you by the time the sun went down today. Amen. Something could introduce itself to you. Amen. By the dawning of tomorrow. Amen. That would make everything you have worthless. I'm going to tell you somebody struggling for their next breath in a hospice bed right now is not concerned about how many things they own. It don't matter right now. It don't matter right now. Amen. That's why we're instructed give us this day our daily Bread. It is not a line to recite. It is not something to just commit to our memory. But there is a principle involved. Oh God, I need you today. Amen. It's an expression of a great truth that the Lord cares for us. But he uses many hands to do so. I'm going to ask our musicians to come if they will. In our text we read this command of the Lord to Elijah. Hide thyself by the brook he did not say hide yourself by the river but he said hide yourself by the brook because the river is always going to contain an abundant supply now we in our congregation here because of our proximity in this part of Florida we are accustomed to rivers because we live near them accessible We've watched major rivers in our area rise, spill out of its banks. We've also seen those major rivers go down. Revealing at times sand and rocks and things that we had not seen perhaps years or maybe even decades. But can I tell you that The river at her lowest is still dumping millions of gallons into the Gulf. So the river will always contain an abundant supply. But the brook, now the brook is an altogether different story. We're also familiar because of our proximity to these tributaries that it's not uncommon to ride up and down 349 and see those brooks and creeks flowing making their way to rivers we've watched them flow and we've watched them dry up amen sometimes they have will flow and they will flow perhaps for months or even a few years We've also watched them dry up for months 
and years. The brook is a much more vulnerable place to live because a, a brook can just dry up at any given moment. And I believe there is a lesson for us here. God did not say, Elijah, go and hide yourself by the river of Jordan. He said, go hide yourself by the brook Cherith that is near Jordan. God doesn't place his people in the depths of extravagance here on this earth. Because I'll tell you that the more God blesses people, the easier they forget God. Amen. I'm not here to be negative today, but I'm going to tell you, we live in a nation that has largely forgotten God. And it has come in on the wings of prosperity. Because there's a lot of people today, it would probably shock us and offend our self, our righteous indignation. But there's a lot of people today that don't feel like they need God. The economy can be high or it can be low, but they're still going to their coffers and living as though nothing ever happened. Amen. So if we live by the river, we may be prone to forget God. So God just prefers to put us at a brook. Because a brook may be running today and it may be dried up tomorrow. And I said in our first service and will say to you today that just a few weeks ago we found that to be true. Everything was normal. March the 15th we walked out of here. We were shaking hands, hugging necks. See you Wednesday. We didn't realize that the brook was about to dry up. And that we would be forced into several weeks of not able, being able to come together in a corporate manner and worship the Lord. We had to learn how to worship Him at home by ourselves. We had to learn how to pray alone. We had to learn how to delve into the Word of God. We had to learn how to tune into services and receive it through another medium than what we were accustomed to because the brook dried up. But what do we do when the brook dries up? Amen. I believe that we must place our trust and confidence in the one who sent the brook to begin with. We can ask ourselves, why do these things happen? And I would say I believe that oftentimes things happen in our life to teach us a lesson. And the lesson in this should be this, that we're not supposed to rest in the gifts we're not supposed to rest in the blessings, but we are supposed to rest in the giver. And we are supposed to find our rest in the blesser. Amen. I want to tell you, I'm not insulting your intelligence. My intention is not to insult your intelligence today. But when you turn that faucet on in your sink, there's no need for you to stand there and praise that faucet. Because it has very little to do with what's coming out. Somewhere far removed from that moment of enjoyment, something's working way underneath the ground. Something is supplying that. Amen. Today, what we have can all be taken away so quickly. Amen. So God is saying we need to be careful that we don't find ourselves resting in the gift and not the giver. Amen. And so I say, God, if you won't trust me by the river, then hide me by the brook. <laughs> Amen. My message today, hidden by the brook. Amen. If you leave me by the river, Lord, I might forget. I might soon forget. Amen. It is said of Israel that when they were full, they forgot God. He warned them, when you move into homes you didn't build, and when you start reaping from vineyards you didn't plant, be sure to remember, be sure to remember. But they didn't remember. Amen. I pray God help us. Amen. Sometimes God just steps into the forefront of our lives and reminds us, amen, that our dependency is upon Him. I want you to stand, if you will. Can I tell you that for some people, and I, I don't make my remarks here today solely, specifically, exclusively to our church family. I won't exclude us from this. But I believe this season of time 
of the brook drying up has drawn some closer to God. They have cultivated their prayer life, their study, their devotion, their dedication to their consecration. It has drawn them. But for others, this season of disconnect has served to feed their carnal flesh. And as a result, they are drifting further from the moorings of God and His Word. Now, I want to tell you that what we have experienced didn't cause people to draw closer. And it didn't cause people to drift. It simply revealed what was already brewing. Amen. The Old Testament minor prophet said, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. He didn't say if I fall, by chance if I fall. He said when I fall. Can I tell you today that falling is just part of living. And so I want to wake up every day and say, Lord, help me to lean toward you. That when I fall, I will fall into the arms of grace and fall into the arms of mercy. Amen. So I'll ask you today, where will you drive down your tent stakes? Will it be by the river? Or will we be the one that raises our hand and say, Lord, just hide me by the brook. Just hide me by the brook. And when the river dries up, when the brook dries up, when the water goes away, I'm going to hold on, God, because I know you're just about to send me somewhere else. Amen. Let's magnify the Lord. Can we do it today? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. There's no more.